It isn't everyone who gets a chance to hit reset on their lives and start over. It isn't everyone who in fact gets to do it multiple times. I'm here today to reset my life yet again. And I'm going to do that for the first time by sharing a little bit of my life with you. I was but a preschooler when I took my first big decision. And that decision was my name. I decided that I wanted to choose the name that I would like to be known by. In my family tradition, the first girl child born in the family takes her grandmother's name. And much as I loved my grandmother, I wanted a name all of my own. So not only did I take my own name, I even chose how to spell it. But honestly, calling it a decision at that young age would be a bit of a stretch. I think it was more like a tantrum, but my parents indulged me. To be honest, I was barely five then, and I hardly knew the meaning of the word decision or even its consequences. As I grew older, I became aware of more and more things of what was right for me and what was wrong for me. Why and why not were the two favorite phrases that I used over and over again with my parents. Mind you, I was reasonable enough to listen to everybody's opinions, but not that reasonable that I would blindly accept them. And you can, as you can all of you understand, that behavior of mine got me into a lot of trouble with my parents. Again, in my defense, I don't think I really understood the meaning of the word consequence. When it was time for college, I decided to major in mathematics, like all good South Indians, as Anil told you before. I decided if I couldn't get into engineering, like all good South Indians, maybe this was the next best thing. I figured this would be good and I would get this done, but my father, who was much more aware of my capabilities, was a little skeptical, but I decided I would prove him wrong. Needless to say, this wasn't the cakewalk that I was assuming it would be, and I struggled through my final year. Finally, the meaning of the word consequences hit me, and I understood what it meant, but giving up was not the meaning that I was going to take away from this experience in my life. As I grew older, my life started looking like a series of puzzles in a, in a jigsaw puzzle. It looked like a series of pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. And with every step in life, I felt that I was faced with decisions, consequences, puzzle pieces, and empty spaces on the board that I needed to fill. I had reached adulthood now, and my parents expected me to marry someone from my own caste a good South Indian, Tamil, Brahmin, Ayur boy <laughs> who would share the same kind of food, the same culture and the same language. But as per, as per my own reputation before, I decided to go and marry somebody else instead. I married a Maharashtrian. He spoke Marathi. He ate meat. And his culture was very different than mine. I thought I had a good marriage and I was happy that I got to choose my own life partner, but little did I know how tough this was going to be on me. A decade and three children later, I was battling domestic abuse and I was living in a country far, far away from home. I had a great corporate job, three beautiful children, but no happiness. I had made my own decisions, and they came to bite me in the face, but I was living the consequences this time. When we moved back to India a few years later, I decided to quit my corporate job and do what I loved most. I wanted to be with my children. So we moved back to India, and a chance meeting with a very old friend gave me the courage to make my next big decision. So I decided to walk out of the marriage with three children, no job, and very little money to speak of. But I was happy. My parents expected, like all parents do, that I would go back to corporate and start earning well again. 
But I wanted to do something far less stressful and decided to focus on being with my children. I wanted to give them positive memories to live by. So I decided to do what I really love, that is being in the outdoors and working with children. So I took up a job taking children outdoors to the mountains to trek. I was a facilitator teaching them outbound learning programs in the mountains. And the perks, I got to take my kids along with me. I also became a teacher a little later on. I taught children in high school, even enrolled my own children in my same school. Money was tight, but my kids and I, we were tighter and life was good and all was happy. Things would have continued if then I hadn't met my second husband. We met through a common love of trekking. And much against the expectations of my parents, my conservative parents and family, I married again. And this jigsaw puzzle of my life was starting to open up a new piece yet again. A chance solo trek into the Himalayas brought me face to face with my destiny. In June 2010, I went for my first solo trek into Ladakh. Not being able to acclimatize properly, I suffered from pulmonary edema, my lungs filled with water. I was saved because of the kindness of complete strangers, and I was living in a remote mountain village with just one home. There were no roads, no electricity, no mobile connectivity, not even a healthcare system to take care of me. But I survived. It was during my stay in this little village that I saw my first mountain school. This village school had seven, two teachers and seven children, all ranging from grade four down to kindergarten. This school is the only hope for all the children living in that village. I met one of the teachers on the way to this trek. And this teacher was walking back. He took a two-day walk to the main town of Leh, where he was going there to get basic supplies for his school. It would take him two days. He told me that it would take him two days to go, so he would be away for a whole week. And he said, I'll be back in a week. And this other teacher would fill in for me during my absence. I came and I met this teacher in the school. This is a village called Hankar. I met this teacher. And on seeing me with my horse and my supplies that I had, he begged me. He begged me to trade his one bottle of instant coffee for the few tomatoes that I was carrying for my trek. He said, and I quote, I haven't seen tomatoes in ages. I gave him the tomatoes. I asked him to keep the instant coffee, I also cooked and fed this entire school. Nothing in my life had ever prepared me for this experience. I was a teacher then. This is the image of the middle, one of the primary schools. This school, it had nothing but just two rooms and one whiteboard. But the two teachers here themselves came from faraway villages and they moved lock, stock and barrel. They left their homes and their families to come here to teach these little children. The children themselves came to school every single day. They were driven by the desperation of very young parents who longed for a great education for their children just so they can get good government jobs and be secure in life. I was extremely moved by this, and I came back with a fire in my belly. I came back with a purpose and a vision. I came back thinking I wanted to do something for this region. It was a simple enough idea. I wanted to change the status of education, the quality of education for the children of Ladakh. But there was just one problem, 
one big problem. 60,000 square kilometers of a problem, to be precise. This is Ladakh. Ladakh is a high altitude mountainous region that is spread over 60,000 square kilometers and exists in altitudes upwards of 9,000 feet in inhabited regions. This area is shut for six months due to heavy snow. Villages in this area are subject to minus 15, minus 60 degrees centigrade in the extreme winter. And villages are cut off for months of, the, of a time, and villagers learn to live by themselves without being able to come out. Not just this. This is an area where most of the villages still don't have access to roads, mobile connectivity, electricity, and basic services that you and I take for granted. This was a problem that I faced. How do you solve a problem this big? So I went to a lot of people in the social sector. And I went with them, to them with my intention, saying I want to improve the quality of education in remote mountain villages like this. I had a lot of advice and a lot of support. But the biggest thing I heard was, Sujata, you're mad. This is not going to happen. This is very challenging. How are you going to do this by yourself? I had support, but there was nobody willing to go with me on my journey. So I took my next big decision. I roped in my husband and my Ladakhi friend. And I said, if you want to do something, you want to make a change in life, do this yourself. So along with them, I started 17,000 Feet Foundation. 17,000 Feet Foundation is an organization that works to improve the lives and quality of education for very young children living in remote mountain villages of the Indian Himalayas. It was hard. Taking a decision that big was not that easy. It was hard. And in the first few years, my team and I, we traveled hundreds of thousands of, hundreds of villages. It took us seven months. But in these seven months, we visited each and every school of Ladakh to understand what was going on. Schools were isolated from villages. This is a school in Kargil. Schools were isolated and kept aside, and these are the only hope for children who live in such remote villages. In every village that we saw, every child was going to school. There was no child that we knew who did not go to school. But the interiors of these schools were like this. Most of these schools suffered from extremely poor resources. They didn't have furniture for the children to sit on, no play material for them, no outdoor play material. They didn't even have storybooks to read. Most of the villages I went to had never seen storybooks. The teachers who I met had never seen storybooks. And this is what I was faced with. It was hard. Traveling to these remote villages came with its own set of challenges. People didn't fund us. It was difficult to find funding for a non-profit that chooses to work with villages which are so remote, hard to reach, and sometimes take two days of a trek to reach. I even had a problem trying to find a team to put together. So my first few days, I used my own funds, and I used my own children. I set them across to the length and breadth of Ladakh to help us map the region. There were bigger challenges, poor weather, extremely bad roads, bad condition of the vehicles, unavailability of fuel. But saying no was never an option. So, these are children who even come to school in minus 25 degree winters. I have seen children who come to school with just a socks on when I myself was wearing three or four layers just on my footwear. This for me was an inspiring enough journey for me. And we started it gave us the model of what we needed to do to make 17,000 feet work. 17,000 feet foundation works with frontier villages in the Indian Himalayan regions, and there are 11 states which share similar problems like Ladakh. So what did we do? We set up playgrounds. We've set up over 250, 300 plus playgrounds across Ladakh, and now Sikkim as well. These are areas which a barren land where children have nothing else to play on but pieces of paper. 
We set up playgrounds. Some of these playgrounds were carried by us on horseback, on muleback, or just on foot, where entire villages came out to assist us. We've set up classroom furniture in hundreds of schools. <laughs> where children sit on cold, bare floors. We wanted to give them a chance to sit on furniture and enjoy their academics. We've painted hundreds of schools. Schools which were drab were now colorful and inviting for the children to come in. We've carpeted every room of all the schools that we've adopted. And we've set up libraries, set up 450 libraries. <laughs> I have given over 300,000 books across these mountain villages, and our team goes every month to read and tell stories to children. Not just this, our Anganwadis, where the little babies, the three to five, the ones who were being sent away, we upgraded and made their spaces colorful and inviting again. But this wasn't enough for us. We've digitized a few hundred schools. These are in areas which have neither electricity, mind you, nor mobile connectivity. Being from the tech industry, we brought together a, a solution that would work in regions like this. I've trained thousands of teachers, and today 70,000 children have had access to better education, thanks to 17,000 feet. And things would have been fine if it weren't for COVID, and COVID struck us really hard. We lost funding, our schools shut down, our children couldn't go, go to learn. We lost funding and we had to stop our projects, but we persevered. Thanks to our donors and supporters, as well as the Crow Fund that Nagma talked about, we persevered, we rolled up our sleeves, took a pay cut, revitalized our programs, not just this. By the end of the COVID year, I had grown, by end of 2021, I had grown 17,000 feet six times to expand to Sikkim and cover a few more hundred schools. For that, I was awarded, as was already explained, by the Honorable Late uh, President Sri Pranam Mukherjee for my work. And this was the pride of my life. And things would have been fine if my jigsaw puzzle didn't open up again. If my jigsaw puzzle didn't open up and just show me another space that, that needed to be filled. You see, while I was busy building 17,000 feet foundation, I was again struggling with an equally second traumatic marriage. So I took the next big decision. I, st I walked out of that marriage and I walked out of 17,000 feet foundation. And I'm here today, standing in front of you, living my truth. I am here today because my, the jigsaw puzzle that is my life has just opened up a new opportunity. I'm excited yet again to see what my new life keeps ahead of for me. And I'm here, hopefully we'll be back to share with you another story. Thank you. <laughs>